very very warm welcome to everyone um, we are very delighted to also know that uh, there are some uh, school children uh, who have also joined this meeting interested in history and i hope this talk will uh, be very engaging and entertaining for them uh, let me quickly uh, start the proceedings um, my name is uh, rahul sarapte and i am an assistant professor in the division of humanities and languages um i would again uh, like to warmly welcome everyone for the seminar and the lecture series of the school of arts and sciences at amdavad university uh amdavad university uh, uh this is an effort on our part uh, to initiate learning that is not just limited to the confines of a classroom uh, but we would like to emphasize on having multiple platforms through which students can learn and benefit the seminar and lecture series is one such platform which promotes and facilitates meaningful engagement between the students and the faculty of our university and distinguished scholars of different disciplines from all over the world our aim is always to invite academics who can present some aspects of their fascinating research and engage with the community here in amdavad we also encourage participation from outside of the university so as to make this engagement more universal and diverse in nature Today we are fortunate to have with us Professor Maya Jasnov and Professor Patrick French, who will explore the art and craft of writing biography, in particular the literary biography. This dialogue will engage with some thematic and conceptual concerns, such as the relationship between literature and biography uh, or autobiographical uh, um, archives, the intersections between the literary, the political, and the intellectual aspects of a person's life. and the process through which the biographer understands the specific individual genius in its wider historical and political contexts let me quickly introduce our participants very briefly uh, professor maya jasnov is the nancy young professor of arts and sciences and the college professor of history at harvard university and she is also a visiting professor at amdavad university Professor Jasnov's biographical work on Joseph Conrad, uh, The Dawn Watch, Joseph Conrad in a Global World, published in 2017 has won prestigious Kandil Prize for the year 2018. Um let me also introduce our other speaker today, Professor Patrick French is the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences and the Professor of Public Understanding of Humanities at Ahmedabad University. His biography of a uh, renowned writer V S Naipaul Uh, titled the world is what it is autobiographical uh, authorized biography of vs naipaul was the winner of the national books critics circle award in biography in 2008 he is currently working on the biography of doris lessing the moderator today is professor aparajit ramnath who is also uh, an associate professor in uh, the division of humanities and languages who is also working on a biography of sir vishveshwaraiya without further ado Let me then call upon Professor Jasnov to start the proceedings for the meeting. Thank you, Rahul, and um, it's lovely to see some familiar names and familiar faces in the group today. And I'm delighted to be back in Ahmedabad, uh, where I am sitting, even though we are convening right now on Zoom. Um, so I think that the format that uh, Patrick and I had in mind for today was to each say a little bit about our. own work but we would really like to engage in a bit of a dialogue with each other and also with you and for those of you who saw the poster that was designed for this event you'll see that uh, we've um, gotten up to some uh, uh, entertainment outside the parameters of uh, writing biographies uh, ourselves and so we wanted to infuse this with a little bit of a uh, sort of lighthearted spirit um so let me just uh, say a little bit about my uh, work about Joseph Conrad i'm going to share a few slides um which of course means that i have to figure out how to do that here uh just a moment let me do that and i will share my screen here we are okay so um so the book that i wrote which uh, rahul just mentioned is a biography of uh, joseph conrad except it's not a biography of Joseph Conrad or at least that's certainly not how I at any point in it really would have described it what i would have said at any point while i was working on the book and uh indeed in many ways after the book has been completed is that this book is a history a history 
of the life and times of Joseph Conrad, a history of a period which uh, marked the beginnings of what we would now call modern globalization, a term which didn't exist in Conrad's uh, own day around the turn of the 20th century, and yet a term that very accurately, I think, captures many of the things that were going on in the world that he knew and described, such as uh, the uh, rapid uh, expansion and acceleration of uh, global communications infrastructure, transportation, migration, the interconnection of financial markets, and much, much more. And my idea when I started this book was uh, to use the work of Conrad to trace a kind of alternate history of the world around 1900, a world which was uh, really uh, best known to me through my studies of the history of the British Empire, because it was around 1900 that the British Empire reached its kind of apogee of uh, global hegemonic power, as well as nearly its greatest territorial expanse. And you can see it in this rather familiar type of image where all of the colonies uh, that uh, Britain uh, controlled at that time around 1900 are marked on the map in pink. Now, when you look at Conrad's work, which is set all over the world, one of the things that I was particularly struck by is that a map of Conrad's work, which I have marked here popping out in these bubbles, speech bubbles, is that the locations of his major works of fiction are actually not, for the most part, in the British Empire. And in fact, even the books that he wrote, which deal with uh, British subjects, British ships, for example, he wrote a lot about, uh, about the sea and about mariners, often feature non-British characters. So I was aware from the get-go that I was working on something that was sort of a little bit off kilter as a, a book uh, looking at the uh, you know, broadly sort of British and imperial world. I wanted to give a kind of different angle onto this, uh, this period uh, and, uh, and, and, and the regions and places and characters uh, that interested me within it. So I started working on this book in much the way that I started all other projects that I've done. I went to an archive or the archives as they are often called. And I went specifically in this case to Rhodes House in Oxford, which uh, has a lot of papers uh, related to different aspects of British expansion in the later 19th century. Uh, and in particular, I was kind of turning over lots of papers to do with a family uh, active in uh, what's now Malaysia um, and was sort of going through all this uh, in order to get a better sense of a region that features very prominently in some of Conrad's fiction. Now, as I was doing this, um, turning over page after page after page and kind of cramped and difficult to read 19th century handwriting, I grew increasingly frustrated. And it wasn't just that I was frustrated with the handwriting, although that was part of it. I was also frustrated with uh, what I felt to be my aimlessness as I was going about this project. Because as I was reading these documents, I sort of realized that I wasn't discovering much new about the history of Southeast Asia that hadn't been written by others. And I was certainly discovering nothing at all about Joseph Conrad specifically, uh, who wasn't in the places I was reading about at the times that I was reading about them. And it told me nothing at all about his fiction either. So I found myself sort of puzzled and at something of a dead end. Because embarrassingly to admit, although I had gone into this book thinking, this project thinking, okay, I'm going to write a history through the life and work of Joseph Conrad, I hadn't really stopped to think in any meaningful way about what the fiction was doing in this project for me in the first place. I was basically using Conrad in an incredibly instrumental way uh, because he happened to be in and write about a set of locations that I was sort of interested in that I thought gave a new picture of the British Empire at its height. And I was just using them as a kind of way to string together a bunch of different stories. But Conrad himself once said something rather interesting about the relationship between fiction and history, and here it is in front of you, namely fiction is history, human history, or it is nothing. And I found myself thinking about that to wonder what it was that he really meant by it. And he went on to say a little bit more in this same passage. He says, 
It is also more than that. It stands on firmer ground because uh, being based on the reality of forms and the observation of social phenomena, whereas history is based on documents, on secondhand impression, quote unquote. So in other words, what he's saying is that fiction is a kind of firsthand account of perception of thought. It lets you get inside the mind of the past in a way that perhaps historical documents of a more conventional kind do not. So I realized I was looking at maybe the wrong sources. And I was also perhaps asking the wrong question, not so much. I, I mean, the question I was asking is, what did Conrad see? That is, what did he see that he put in his novels? Whereas perhaps what was more interesting was the question, why did Conrad see these things? And how did he come to see them? How did one person, this author, come to write about the kinds of places and people and themes that he did. And to answer that, I realized I had to go in a different research direction, not into the archives of primary uh, documents um, handwritten in the 19th century, stuffed away in Rhodes House, but rather the documents that Conrad himself left in relation to his own life. And so rather than rush off to another country, I instead headed straight to the library on my own university campus. And I checked out all of the nine volumes of Conrad's collected correspondence. Um, these are the letters that he's written, that he wrote to people that have survived and been collated and, and very carefully and uh, very thoroughly annotated and edited and published uh, by Cambridge University Press uh, in uh, nine volumes uh, uh, spanning uh, the course of his life. So I started reading my way through these uh, letters that Conrad had, had written um, during the course of his life and, and sort of reading about him in his own words. And what I discovered was that Conrad didn't only sort of witness the world around 1900 as it was undergoing this kind of step change in, in what we would now call globalization. Conrad embodied this set of global interconnections of his day. He was born, not Joseph Conrad, but Conrad Korzeniowski, uh, to Polish parents in present day Ukraine, parts of the world that are very much in the headlines right now. Um, he was raised as a subject of the Tsarist Russian Empire. And at the age of about 17, he left Central Eastern Europe to make his way to France, where he trained to be a sailor. It was as a sailor that he would then make his way to England uh, in his early 20s, not speaking a word of English at that time, um, landing in England in uh, eight, the late 1870s, uh, and continuing his career as a sailor for what would end up being a total of about 20 years before he ever wrote fiction at all. So by the time he becomes a novelist in his late 30s publishing fiction, Conrad has reinvented himself uh, from a Polish person who speaks Polish as his first language, French as his second language, English as his third language, um, and as a professional sailor who had become a, a captain in the British Merchant Marine, um, he's gone through all of these changes uh, and, and come out the other end as the figure that we know of now as Joseph Conrad, the author of novels in English. And it is in this role as a sailor that he will end up traveling around the world and collating much of the material that will end up making its way into his later fiction. Just as one example, um, he goes to Congo in Central Africa in 1890 as a ship captain. Uh, but as he goes to Congo as a ship captain, he has already begun writing fiction in his spare time. And so um, we have from his trip to uh, Congo two quite interesting manuscripts, one of which uh, you'll see uh, it, here is uh, the manuscript of um, his first novel, um, which uh, will be published in the mid 1890s called Almer's Folly. And I've picked a page here from the manuscript which some, with some nice little doodles that he put on the back of it. Um, and on the other side, you'll see a journal that he kept while he was there in which he's um, taking notes as a sailor taking notes about how to navigate the Congo River. And this set of notes would go on to inform what is today his best known work of fiction, namely Heart of Darkness, um, which was published uh, in uh, 1899 um, in the uh, Edinburgh Review. Um, 
So these things, the life, the work, they're really interpenetrating in some quite fascinating ways. So this raises a question which I'm sure Patrick will have things to say about as well, namely, how far is it fair to read fiction as autobiographical and vice versa? You know, it's very common for people to uh, think of novels, particularly authors' first novels nowadays, as having a heavy autobiographical component. It's very common for authors themselves to talk about the autobiographical influences on their fiction. Uh, and in Conrad's case, there's plenty of room to look for these kinds of overlaps. Um, but I think in Conrad's case, it's also rather complex. Um, I've put up here a quote from one of the many people who have been sort of inspired for kind of good and for ill, that is inspired positively and negatively by Conrad's legacy. He's been challenged, of course, for his racism in his texts. Um, and that person is Barack Obama, who um, on reading Heart of Darkness uh, as, a, as a student, you know, goes on to talk about how, you know, it's a book that's really about a broader kind of perception of the world. Um, and it thus transcends something about the kind of specifics of its making and tells us something more general about the perspective of the, of the person who made it. Now, Conrad is a, is a tricky figure in this regard, partly because of the um, nine volumes of correspondence that I mentioned to you that have been published, uh, collated and published, 5,000 pages in all. Only about 200 of those pages, a tiny, tiny little bit, deals with the part of his life when he was traveling around the world as a sailor and gathering a lot of the kind of material that would make his way make its way into his later fiction and much of what he said about his life in later years about his earlier life is quite misleading we can check it against other kinds of sources and see that it's misleading so i found myself often trying to kind of work my way around you know the 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 mysteries about conrad's life and about what he said about it by uh, returning to this dictum of karl marx which is quite well known namely that uh, man makes his own history but he does not make it out of conditions chosen by himself so a lot of the work that i did was sort of to try to figure out you know, if I couldn't get inside Conrad's head, I could figure out the circumstances in which he was operating. And I did that through uh, documentary research, archival research, and also through um, even taking some trips of my own, such as on uh, the Congo River. And so what I was left with was this kind of melange in a way where I was working with three layers of sort of evidence. I had the evidence about this individual, Joseph Conrad. I had the evidence from his fiction about the world that he saw and how he saw it. And then I had historical sources from outside that I tried to use to contextualize the material before me. And the final challenge that I faced, and the just the last note that I'll leave you on, um, is that I had to, in my own writing about him and his work and his world, I had to find a way to put these layers together in a narrative. I had to put together the, the historical figure the uh, fictional works and the historical circumstances. And all of this um, led me to kind of adopt some, some techniques that I was in a way inspired to do through Conrad's fiction itself, in which he jumps around chronologically, in which he nests stories within others, uh, in which he shifts the kind of vantage point through which you were seeing things frequently. And what came out was a book that felt to me to be sort of true to the material that I was writing about, but ultimately felt rather different from the way that I used to write history, um, or indeed, potentially the ways in which biography is often traditionally conceived. Um, so I went into this trying to write history through fiction, and I came out of it um, ever more sure of the truth of what Conrad, a novelist, knew, namely that uh, reality, as ever, beats fiction out of sight. I'll end my comments there, and I'm eager to hear from Patrick. Great. Um, Aparajit, shall I just begin right away? Yes, please. OK, great. Well, thank, thanks very much indeed, um, Maya, uh, for what you've said. Um, it was interesting, the reference that you made to Barack Obama, 
Um, because as well as Conrad, another author who he has picked out now and again is V.S. Naipaul. Uh, and he said that one of the approaches that he had himself towards foreign policy or international relations was, is it as bad as V.S. Naipaul says? Is it a case of the world is what it is? Men who are nothing, who allow themselves to become no, nothing, have no place in it. This very kind of cruel and transactional and sort of hyper-realistic view of global engagement, diplomacy, foreign policy? Or can you be more idealistic and try to change and improve the world? Uh, and I think, you know, to an extent when he came into power, things were looking more optimistic than when he came out and perhaps more optimistic than they are in 2022. Um, I also wanted to just touch on the, the, the bio photos that we'd used in the, the promotional poster for this event, which, Maya alluded to, and I'm actually going to share the screen because it really talks to the subject under discussion. And the reason that we put these two photos up instead of more conventional biographical portrait photos of somebody in a professional setting or in an academic setting was just really to try to illustrate the way that you look at an individual's life is massively conditioned by how you approach them whether you approach them through their work, through their professional uh, life, through their personal life, and you look at them in a different way according to that. And when you go into an archive, if you read a personal letter or an official document, you obviously think in a different kind of way. When you look at a photograph of somebody doing something, it's very easy to think that you have deduced something about that person from the photograph. Um, and these two photographs here, um, which are from, I think, Holy in uh, 2018, uh, where we, we both happen to be in the same place, um, it struck me that probably anybody in India viewing those photographs would immediately identify them as holy photographs. Uh, people in other parts of the world might be confused. They might know what, not know what's going on. They might think maybe you're at a kid's party or something like that. So you'd read the photograph in a different way biographically according to the setting. Uh, and it's a bit like the, the, the point that, um, you know, Mary Douglas famously made about what is dirt, what is garbage, it's, it's matter out of place. And in the same way, a photograph like this, in a setting for a biographical photo for a formal event, is out of place. It's jarring what your, your expectation uh, is. And so what I am hoping to do, like Meyer, I'll be speaking quite briefly so as to give quite a lot of time for discussion is really just to run through the questions that we were asking uh, at the very beginning about the idea of writing writers' lives. You know, where does the literary and the personal and the intellectual biography uh, connect? Um, what are the particular challenges in biographical writing if you're writing about an author, about a writer, uh, about an intellectual? And then thirdly, is literature uh, a reasonable biographical and autobiographical uh, source, and how far can we rely on fiction? Um, and I'm giving inevitably slightly summarized answers really just as a way to, to, to get the conversation started. And let me begin by also sharing um, photographs of the people who I'm talking about, because I think very often it's valuable if you sort of have that image. Uh, of the individual. This is Doris Lessing after she's gone from uh, southern Rhodesia, what's today Zimbabwe, to London, and really very, very quickly kind of made her name as a very dynamic, very engaged, very original writer. And you can see something of that kind of attitude in that very frank gaze straight at the camera. Uh, it's almost saying I'm, I'm writing the kind of books that I, I want to, to write. So this is sort of between the grasses singing um, uh, and uh, the golden notebook. It's sort of during that 1950s period. And then a picture of Doris Lessing here in later life when she's very much a kind of preeminent global novelist. You get that sort of sense of security, status, uh, a kind of power. Um, it reminds me slightly of the look that Margaret Atwood has. Uh, it's sort of as if to say, I am where I need to be and you're going to listen. Um, and again, I want to just illustrate the fact that I think when you're writing a biography, you are not ever dealing with a certain kind of source material. 
the archive is everything. So in this case, I'm taking some examples of uh, MI6 intelligence documents reporting on Doris Lessing. Uh, this is the colonial authorities in uh, South Africa and in uh, Southern Rhodesia saying that she has communist sympathies, that she has fanaticism, uh, that she doesn't believe in the color bar, the idea of racial discrimination, that she's a dangerous and radical figure. So it sort of now seems very antiquated, the language that's being used, but very indicative, I think, of the attitudes of the 1950s. And then again, another one where they, this time hand over to the security service, MI5 in um, London, and they talk about the fact that she's doing a sponsored visit to Russia uh, with other people who are also involved with the Communist Party of the UK. So that would be a, a you know one approach to the person coming through declassified intelligence material, which is sort of almost the opposite end of the very personal information that you get through, for example, Doris Lessing's daily diary, which she keeps for almost forty years, and she writes a very closely written long, long page every day for almost 40 years about absolutely everything. Nothing is held back. It's personal, it's professional, it's about trauma, it's about the mental illness of her son, it's about her arguments and making up with her friends. It's sort of the whole story. And I think as a biographer, you're in a very unusual position compared to the historian more generally, in that you're having to take in so many different levels of approach to the individual. Um, and now to go over just again quickly to some photos of the early V.S. Naipaul. This is when he's sort of about to make his name. He's uh, just published his first um, uh, sort of entertaining comic uh, novel set in the Caribbean, set in Trinidad uh, and other parts of the Caribbean. And you then contrast this with not the the young man trying to, to make it, but instead with the, the Nobel laureate with the knighthood and the status and the expensive scarf and the hat. And you know th this way, again, the, the, the sort of photographic image tells you something about the transitional points in an individual's life in a biography. Um, and then contrast that with this photograph of him with Margaret Gooding, his lover. Again, you're getting a picture of V.S. Snipel that is completely absent from the record until you access the archive. Uh, and I think this is reproduced in the in the biography that I wrote. But until you see that version of him, you can have written multiple academic books about the literature of V.S. Naipaul and his position in post-colonial writing. But if you like, this side of him shown in this image is a new face, which you have to try as a biographer to incorporate. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to touch on the thing of how far the literary can uh, you know, reveal the individual. This is the manuscript of his really very disturbing and upsetting book, Gorillas. Um, and it's a, a sort of gruesome end to a particular chapter of two people walking into a bedroom. And you know, if you've read the book, that subsequently the man kills the woman. So uh, you can see something about the obsessive, minute, uh, red biro, fine point and you can see you've got the inches on the left I mean this is this is uh, almost the writing of madness but it generates into very uh, substantial fiction so again you're you're approaching the subject in this sense um, psychologically as well as literarily um, but as to those those questions and how uh, I've tried to approach them I think that if we go back to um, the 1960s, 1970s to academia, that biography was disapproved of. Um, there are people like, for example, Jeffrey Elton, the Regis Professor of History um, at uh, Cambridge or Oxford, I think, Oxford, um, who said that people can write biography if they want, but they shouldn't imagine that's got anything to do with the writing of history. You've got people like, uh, Jermaine Greer saying that uh, the writing of literary biography is, is unethical. Um, Rudyard Kipling calling it the higher cannibalism. Um, against a real sort of transformation, I think, really in about the last sort of 20 or 30 years, when I think there's been a recognition that the, uh, 
life of the individual uh, connects with social history, the history of emotions, the idea of the individual and their role as exemplifying something um, within the uh, historical process. Um, there's a great quote also from the economist Tyler Cowen uh, in which he said that intellectual uh, history is foremost a matter of biography. In other words, if you look at anybody who is influential in intellectual history and in what they write, there's almost always a connection to uh, the personal circumstance, the economic circumstance, the personal trauma, whether they've been through war or bloodshed. Uh, and you can see this with Conrad. I mean, you know, Conrad's worldview, I think, develops very much out of the extreme trauma of his early life. Uh, so I, th I think that there is an argument for saying that if you look at the, the, the way that intellectual history develops from the individual, that that links to uh, biography. And I would, I would suggest that one way to look at biography as uh, an academic discipline, um, and I'm sort of obviously going against that sort of Jeffrey Elton view of 30, 40 years ago. Um, to an extent, I'm taking on board some of the ideas that were coming out of middle Europe and out of Germany about the role of uh, biography uh, towards the end of the 20th century. But I think there is a case for saying that Biography has the capacity to incorporate uh, global history through the story, through the tale of the individual, rather in the way that Maya did when she wrote The Dawn Watch. I also think that it inevitably contains economic history. It inevitably contains social history. Uh, you have to place that individual within the context out of which they're emerging. Um, you know, the quote from Marx, again, is something that I think has been very important to me. You know, people can say, I am the individual, I am driving the process, but there are so many surrounding circumstances that condition the way that they develop. And I think that unless you place them into that social context, you don't understand them uh, within a biography. Uh, I also think that a biography inevitably includes gender history, um, certainly, uh, once you manage to get sort of into, well, not quite the modern era, but into the last three or 400 years, you almost always get family detail. So, you know, the preponderance of biographies in the past have been hagiographies of men in positions of power, either religious power, political power, rulers, and so on. But once you get the materials, there is going to be uh, the mother, the father, the sister, the spouse, the daughter, the niece, you're going to get them in a kind of wider context where gender history inevitably comes into the um, picture. And of course, there are biographies, particularly the sort of multi-volume 19th century biographies coming out of, uh, you know, coming out in the English language where that family side, that personal side gets reduced or diminished. But there are many, many ways that that can be rediscovered. And I think one of the fruitful things about biography at the moment is that it's gone from recovered history, the kind of feminist biography writing of the 1970s and 80s, to an assumption that any biography, if it's going to try to tell the complete story, will ha have elements of the personal life of that person in order to make um, a complete sense. And I think that, you know, also there are other areas you can look at cultural history and how that fits in. And I think the outcome of that is that you have something uh, which I've previously referred to as total context. A good biography should provide total context. Uh, that's a kind of nod to the idea of histoire total or total history. Um, it, it's really taking the individual circumstance and then placing it in that kind of total uh, situation. Um, on the, th on the point about the challenges of writing the biography of writers and authors and intellectuals, I do think it is particularly difficult. Um, I recently reviewed a biography by Timothy Brennan of Edward Said, and with somebody like Said, who is, has been so influential in so many different ways, and has also been so controversial from left and right and from you know, different parts of the world, I think it's a very, very difficult thing to write the sort of intellectual biography that he was seeking to write. I think, you know, generally it was, it was fairly successful, but I think it's a very hard thing to do. And I think it's probably an easier thing to do when you're writing literary biography. 
So I'm hoping that with the biography of V.S. Naipaul and the biography of Doris Lessing, that the linking of the person, Doris or Vidya, to what they wrote, particularly in fiction, is something that it is um, possible to uh, do. And I think it's certainly, if you have a good archive, possible to understand the creative moment that generates great books. Um, I think I was lucky to do this with some of the early V.S. Naipaul. Uh, it was also possible to do it with his book, A Bend in the River, influenced by Conrad, set in Congo, um, where his wife, Patricia, wrote a very detail, detailed diary of the writing of A Bend in the River. And it's almost as if the very best parts of that extraordinary book come alive through the biographical source. Extraordinarily, he would speak out loud paragraphs, pages of the book to Patricia, sometimes in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. And then he would go to his room and he would write those extraordinary uh, chapters. So I do think you get an insight there um, into the creative uh, process and how the, the, the literary and the personal uh, interconnect. And then finally, on the point about fiction as a, as a biographical uh, source, Again, I would, would go back to Naipaul and um, his writings, uh, which are usually, usually um, come, out, come out under the title The Killings in Trinidad. There are different editions of this, this essay. Um, but one of the things that he writes in there about Michael Abdul Malik or Michael X is um, in relation to a sort of memoir that he wrote. And uh, Naipaul's words were, an autobiography can distort um, Facts can be concealed, but fiction never lies. It reveals the writer totally. In other words, if you're a good novelist and you're writing in that kind of heartfelt automatic way that good novelists do, you cannot disguise the emotion that you're putting onto the page. And in that way, you are revealing yourself. And you might be revealing yourself more than you would if you were writing an autobiography or writing a memoir or saying, you know, I'm now going to tell you very honestly about something that I did. So I think that there is a kind of disclosure process almost through fiction writing, uh, which it is possible to retrieve um, in a biography. And I think that Doris Lessing does something a little similar in the Martha Quest books, um, uh, a book like The Four Gated City. She even does it to some extent in uh, the, the Canopus in Argus series, which is science fiction or space fiction, and yet it's sort of oddly personal in some cases, what she um, reveals. So the, the final point that I, I, I just wanted to, to, to make um, was two, two things that I've been thinking about a little bit in regard to how biography may be written in the future. Um, now, the obvious point is that written sources, letters backwards and forwards don't exist. Everything is digital. You know, can you really I, I go through somebody's uh, emails or WhatsApp messages over a 20 year period and you know how many years would that take you? Uh, if it's a public figure, how many millions of hours of video might have been shot of that person? The actual sort of retrieval of information is quite difficult. But there are another couple of things that I think are gonna be uh, tough or at least sort of stimulating for biographers. Um, one is the distortion of reality that we get in the public sphere. And there are multiple global leaders who do this thing of sort of distorting the force field of reality and deliberately putting out not totally false information, but half true information, where people kind of don't know if it's true or they know that bit's true and that bit isn't true. I think that's something that is quite um, hard for historians and biographers. I mean, and maybe just for everybody within social science to, to deal with as a concept of, of how the how you look at reality when public reality is, is constantly being distorted. The other thing that I, I personally find um, interesting is the idea that we are much more genetically predetermined than we thought 20 years ago, certainly 100 years ago. Uh, there are all sorts of things that we are doing that we do that are encoded in our DNA. If you look at, for example, um, studies of twins who are separated at birth, uh, you see that very often, although they may not have seen each other for 40, 50 years, 
They will dress in an almost identical way. Uh, you know, there are cases where two twins met sort of age 50, these two men, and they both were wearing blue shirts and they each had four pe pens in their top pocket. They had very similar hairstyles. Uh, they both had a thing of doing a sort of, <coughs> a sort of cough, coughing laugh where it was sort of unclear if it was a cough or a laugh. There were all these things that probably people around them thought, oh, well, that's sort of his personality. But in fact, there's a genetic predetermination. And I think that makes the idea, again, of the free will of the individual generating biography, something that we have to maybe uh, think about afresh. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Patrick, for uh, those fascinating comments, which, of course, lead to uh, you know, lots of thoughts, lots of questions. I'm sure the audience will have a lot uh, to discuss. Uh, before that, I, I'd like to hear from both of you on a few things. Um, you've touched on um, what makes biography uh, special. You've touched on how it is, it has been for some time looked down upon uh, as a mode of academic inquiry, uh, predominantly because it perhaps implies that certain individuals are more influential than, um, uh, than, than they really were. If you look at uh, larger social structures and so on. So there's this age-old debate between structure and agency. It also depends upon your political view. If you think that um, you know the, the history of certain periods are best told um, from the point of view of the masses, although that's very difficult to do, uh, versus from the life of one very individual, uh, influential person. Uh, so there are all of these um, difficulties uh, with biography. But for all of that, um, one of the things that it really seems to be able to do is to is, is to give you a really vivid sense of time and place uh, in a way that a more uh, you know a more general uh, inquiry into that period or into a community or into a particular society uh, may not be able to do that it may be able to give you intellectual insights but what was it like to be there uh, what was it what were people thinking um, and Contrary to what we think, biography may, doesn't only uh, narrow our vision to individual lives. It acts as a lens to look at, um, you know, worlds that are really much wider. And I think both books, um, The Dawn Watch and uh, The World Is What It Is, uh, show that beautifully. Um, so thank you for this. Um, I want to start by inverting the discussion a little bit. Uh, both of you, Maya, you asked very interestingly, what is the fiction doing in this uh, in this project? And I think. Uh, both of you have spoken um, a great deal about how does the fiction help us to understand that period of history. Um, I want to ask, to what extent does a literary biographer want to or try to do the reverse, um, which is to comment on the literature itself? Um, how does, you know, how much, to what extent are you doubling up as a literary critic? Uh, and trying to give us a new reading of the works of V.S. Naipaul or the works of Joseph Conrad through your understanding of the time and place that they, uh, that they come from? Well, I'm happy to take a stab at that. I mean, I think that, um, so one thing I was struck by when I wrote my book is that I offer plot summaries of the chief novels that I describe in my book. And some people are grieved because of spoilers. I think, look, I mean, you know, these are novels that have been around for an awfully long time. You know, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the, I'm the person who's going to ruin the end of Heart of Darkness for somebody, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but more to the point, um, I was struck at how in classic literary criticism, basically plot summaries are never there. I mean, the assumption is that the text is either familiar enough to the person reading the critical work that some sort of you know, synopsis is irrelevant, or uh, that in a sense, what the literary critic has to say about it transcends the qualities of the text itself. And one sees this in some of the more, if you will, kind of um, uh, grand treatments of literature that I think were more fashionable perhaps in the mid 20th century than they are now, but are, I mean, many ways quite magnificent, but they don't sort of get into the weeds of telling you what's going on in war and peace. They'll just have something to say about a device that's used. So, 
so anyway, I mean, I, I was, you know, maybe a bit in the way that historians disdain biography traditionally, it seems as if literary critics disdain talking about the kind of basics of, you know, what's actually in the novel. Um, and in that sense, I'm sure that my work appears to be quite um, uh, pedestrian. Um, but I'm, I think that for me, at least one of the great inspirations of literary criticism when I came to work on Conrad was the um, invitation that it gave me to read fiction and indeed any sources um, more carefully and slowly and with attention to its uh, created and crafted elements. One of the techniques that we use as historians a lot, and this is something that doubtless the students on this call will have encountered whether or not they've encountered it by this name is uh, what we call close reading. That is, you look at a passage, it is exactly what it sounds like. You look at a passage and you look at it very closely to try to figure out what's actually going on in the text. Why are certain words chosen? What are the you know, implications of them and so on? And you know, close reading is a technique that comes to us, I think chiefly through literary criticism. And I was um, made to, in a way, undo many of the bad habits that I had developed as a historian to just sort of race through documents and gut books for the takeaways that I wanted to have and indeed go back and read very closely and sort of be attentive to why certain moves and choices were being made when they were. And I like to think that I was able to do, a, you know, add a couple of things to Conrad criticism by kind of piecing together a little bit of this from the history and a little bit of that from the textual reading. But I think for me, at least, what I took from it was a, a more sort of methodological, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where the room is for methodological conversation in how we read texts as historians, as opposed to literary critics. And I think there's room for dialogue there. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think that, uh, in fact, that, that final methodological point is very interesting because if you read biographers on the theory of biography or their methodological, methodological approach, almost without exception, they deny that they have any theoretical approach to the writing of biography. And I think that comes partly because quite a few people come through an indirect route. I mean, there are people who come as trained historians into writing biography, but they're probably the minority. And again, people who are coming out of writing literary criticism into writing literary biography, they're, they're taking a slightly different uh, approach to it also. So I, I think that um, it is quite interesting how untheoretical biography tries to be, even though in practice it is normally following quite definite guidelines about what it's what it's seeking to do. Um, there's also the point that when, uh, you know, you have, for example, writers, uh, particularly writers in sort of later life being horrified about the idea of a biography being written of them. Um, I think it's, it's important to say that almost any biographer of quality will have set down ethical guidelines of how they are approaching the subject. I think it's almost impossible not to, in fact, particularly when you know very personal information about somebody who uh, maybe has died relatively recently, where there may be things that are potentially damaging to people who are still living. In the case of writing about V.S. Naipaul, I had the very odd experience of writing about somebody who was still living at that time. Um, and the, the sort of approach that I had was really to act as if he wasn't there, but then I was also conscious of things that I might not want to put in because of the offense they would cause to individuals. So I kind of, in those cases, almost sort of summarized things that might be more likely to cause um, offense. In, term, in terms of the, the sort of earlier, earlier point uh, of Rajit's question about how far you go to literary criticism, um, I, I think not too far because that's not what I'm seeking to do. I'm trying to link the life to the work. Um, and that means going into the work in a certain amount of detail, but I wasn't really trying to do any very substantive sort of repositioning of how Naipaul should be understood. And I don't think I would do that either with Doris Lessing. Uh, I've got the complication with Doris Lessing that she wrote between 60 and 70 books, depending on how you calculate it. And, you know, if you were to write a, a sort of five page plot summary of each book, you would have 
gone into another volume <laughs> quite quickly. So I think that, you know, in that situation, you have to be a little selective. And probably with any biography, you have to do what, you know, Lytton Strachey said, which is you go and row, out, row your rowing boat out into the ocean and you take a bucket on a rope and you lower it down into the deep and you pull it up and you see what's in the bucket. Um, you cannot cover everything unless you're going to write multiple volumes. And in general, I don't like multiple volume biographies, except in some cases, I think it's justifiable. Um, for example, the Picasso biography, um, which John Richardson began, and I think uh, Gies von Hensbergen is finishing, it kind of made sense to have it in three or four volumes. But normally when I pick up a biography and it's sort of 980 pages long, I just think the writer has been idle. They haven't bothered to sift and reduce the material and write a 400 page book. Well, I also, if I can just jump in on that, Patrick, I mean, I think one interesting thing about biography is the word means writing a life, but you know, there's a, there's a way in which a life course lends itself to narrative because and particularly a narrative that is organically familiar to all the humans but the writing of the life needs to follow its own written narrative and i share your sense that sometimes there are these biographies that are hundreds and hundreds of pages because they just seem to decide that every year in the person's life needs to be written about and yet you know when you're writing biography, a lot of the art is specifically to write it, that is to figure out what the story that you want to pull out is, and you might need to leave out all kinds of things. And so, you know, again, my Conrad book is only, I think, very obliquely considered a biography, because it's not in any way kind of attempting to give a cradle to grave, you know, point by point discussion of this person's life. So plot is an interesting, I mean, I found myself thinking a lot in writing about a writer, about the question of plot and how, what do we mean by plot and how do we plot a life? And I don't have many specifics to, to sort of offer about it, except to say that the, that the historian is plotting the past in the same way the biographer is plotting the subject of the biography. Um, and to imagine that the biography is a kind of, you know, mirror to the life, I think is to do both the life and the work a bit of injustice. And, and, and also, also just, just to say that, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, I've tried with each biography I've written to think, would it be possible to write it out of chronology? Could it be a better story if you take it out of chronology? But there is something about the narrative of a life that's irresistible. I mean, it's like the picaresque novel. It's like you, you want to see the story of this young person and the family circumstance and what they managed to escape and how they reinvent themselves and the period of ambition that then leads, leads to the to the achievement. Um, there's something amazing about the narrative that you're just given by the chronology. And yet also about the narrative that you're given by the fiction, right? When the when the writer is being autobiographical, because you know, I don't I, I don't know to what extent you found you find this with Lessing or found it with Naipaul, but that idea that the author is revisiting their own life from a later vantage point gives you, I mean, this is where I kind of broke a little bit of linear chronology because you had these two different kinds of person. You had the person as they were going through their life chronologically, linearly living it. And then you had the person who was reflecting back on it and pulling out different things for uh, revisiting in later life. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, there's a definite similarity between Conrad Naipaul and Lessing in that they are globalized individuals who don't belong in any one country, any one society, any one uh, part of the world. Uh, you know, and again, in fact, with all three, they had comparatively uh, traumatic and in, in Lessing and Naipaul's case, uh, very much sort of poverty ridden childhoods out of which certain, certain things happened. And I think that with people who are sort of so um, capacious and who reinvent themselves, inevitably they go back into their life and they take particular things and they revisit them. Um, and I did write about that a few times with V.S. Naipaul, the way that he would take aspects of the colonial Trinidad of his childhood, and he would sort of retell the same story in different ways in different books. I think that's uh, fascinating. You have, you know, when you talk as a historian, you talk about different kinds of sources. And here you have, um, both of you just mentioned that you could have sources from different 
times in the subject's life referring to a particular period in their life. So I think, Patrick, at the beginning of your book, you have bits where you are uh, using Michael's memory, you know, his recollections in his Nobel lecture to talk about his childhood, although you've started from the childhood. Um, and then, you know, you also weave in, for instance, um, parts of his literary oeuvre that you think correspond to certain parts of his life along with that discussion. Uh, so clearly, I think I understand that in, in the larger debate about whether literature should, you, you know, be understood purely from the text um, or from uh, a larger, you know, social context, a biographical context, um, uh, I think both books uh, demonstrate the, the sheer value of uh, being able to look behind the scenes, as it were. Um, I was going to ask you if you ex expected a, a reader of either of your books to be familiar already with the works of uh, each author, but I think Maya has answered that to some extent. Uh, you want to be accessible to someone who may not have read everything by Conrad, who may not be you know, very familiar with, uh, with the work, and perhaps your book can send that reader to uh, the work as well. Um, some, um, you know, but particularly vivid passages in both books. Um, I was thinking of uh, Maya of your book where you talk about um, Conrad on board ship and, uh, you know, the whole drill when the, the bell rings in the morning and he has to get up and uh, he's in the merchant navy and he has all kinds of duties. Um, and this is a very vivid recreation. Now, obviously, uh, traveling to a particular place is part of the research that enables that. Um, in fact, it, you, you talked about how going to Trinidad uh, enabled you to understand the sort of the way in which Naipaul made these flippant remarks, which, you know, could be construed as, um, as hurtful. Well, sometimes they were, but, <laughs> but you know, that they, it came from a certain background of this verbal banter, which you understood when you went to, uh, to Trinidad. But, you know, uh, traveling cannot give all the material that you need to create that that, re that reconstruction of time and place and atmosphere. So what are some of the techniques that you both have, have used uh, to do that? Well, in my case, I kind of come at it from two ends. One is the textual primary source root of the period. So, uh, so for example, for the passage you're talking about where I try to reconstruct a day at sea, I read a number of mariners sort of accounts from exactly that kind of that that decade and on that sort of ship. I read a maritime dictionary that kind of laid out it was like a seaman's manual that laid out all of the things that they had to do. Um, I at other points in my research sort of looked up all the kinds of questions that were asked on the exams that Conrad would have taken as he became a uh, you know, moved through the ranks of um, second mate, first mate, and uh, master mariner, and um, and so I basically went in deep into the um, into the into the riches of um, obscure printed materials of the nineteenth century. Many of them available on uh, Google Books, which is very handy. Um, but I also um, spent a month on a container vessel sailing from. Hong Kong to England, because I wanted to have some understanding of what it was like to spend a protracted period of time at sea, given that, I mean, not only, of course, did Conrad do this as his profession, but also, you know, everyone who traveled between continents or um, uh, until the 60s, and in some cases after that, did it by sea. I mean, so I just was struck at how if I wanted to get some understanding even of many of the people that I've written about in the past, this this would be a, a, an important kind of experience to try to replicate. Now, obviously, one can't do what uh, one has to be aware of what um, anthropologists call, you know, upstreaming. You don't want to take your experience right now and assume that it was identical to the one in the past. But, you know, you can, I think what we're always doing is a kind of triangulation. And for me, that sense of just getting up every day and looking out at the water and being cut off from certain kinds of information, but being very closely in contact with this small group of people. Those are things that haven't changed that much. And um, and I, I think that gave me a, a feel for this life of the sailor that, you know, albeit in an attenuated form for me, a month 
only and, and on a different kind of vessel rather later in world history, uh, it, it did help me make sense of some of those works that I was reading from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would say that my approach was very um, similar to the one that Maya, Maya just outlined. I think you have to go physically to the places where that person was, uh, where they lived, uh, you know, where they were raised as a child. Uh, the physical sense of, of landscape and place is very important. Uh, so that's something that I've, I've always done. Um, I think that where you're writing about something relatively recent, probably let's say 19th, 20th century or 21st century, uh, you want to try to meet people or go to places and talk to people who come from within that society. Um, so, you know, with, in the case of V.S. Naipaul, the, the English story for him was quite immediately accessible uh, to me. I also knew the context in which he'd interacted with people in India. I interviewed quite a lot of the people who'd interacted with him from the 1960s, you know, right through to the, to the end of the book. Um, and again, in Trinidad, it was very valuable talking to people who were from that milieu, who'd been to the same school, who'd grown up in a similar world. You know, what are, what are their attitudes? What are their social, cultural attitudes? What kind of education do they, do they have? What do they think is um, important? Uh, that can be extremely uh, valuable, I think, just to try to get a kind of context about the individual. And then again, you know, things like works of social history, cultural history, memoirs of people who were around at the same time, even things like economic history being written around the time of that person, you learn um, a lot. So, you know, just to, to, to give an example in the case of Naipaul, the fact that uh, people of Indian descent in Trinidad, when he was growing up in the 1930s, uh, were almost invariably perceived as being illiterate. They were seen as being the least literate uh, ethnic community within Trinidad, because most of them were descended from indentured laborers who after the abolition of slavery had been shipped out uh, to the Caribbean to work the sugar plantations. That was the world he came out of. Um, so when you start to sort of read that history, you, you have this feeling of, what an extraordinarily rough and tough world he was in when he was a child of 10 years old and what the assumptions about him as a schoolboy would have been. Um, and some of the attitudes, some of the cruelties in his own work and in his own life, I think come out of that uh, deprivation. And I think in the case of Doris Lessing, it's a very different kind of context, it's colonial, segregated Rhodesia. Uh, but again, her family, you know, her, her father was a veteran of World War I who'd had his leg blown off and he was trying to scratch a living as a farmer, as a poor farmer on bad land. So again, you get somebody with, all, all, with very, very restricted opportunities. And by reading the memoirs and the, the books around the subject, suddenly the individual starts to make uh, historical sense and you see why they were the way that they were. Absolutely. I think uh, speaking briefly for myself, I think also that has been one of the uh, greatest, uh, you know, learnings from trying to learn how to write a biography. Uh, it's the opportunity it gives you to, um, to just dive so deep into the society that the person is a part of in ways that sometimes you don't when you're looking at larger interpretive um, you know, or analytical histories, um, and uh, and that's been really uh, has been really interesting. Um, I, I know the audience is ready to ask a few questions. Um, I have just one very brief question for both of you before uh, we start taking audience questions. Um, I request uh, those in the audience to please put your uh, questions in the chat box, and we will uh, take it from there. My question, uh, my last question, is a very short one. Um, do you have to identify with your subject in some way? Do you have to share something in terms of background um, or is it better if you come from a completely different angle? 
Okay, we'll we'll take that with the audience questions because I don't want to eat into the time for um, for the audience. Um, okay, just to get started, um, we have a question from Padmaja Anand. Uh, there are two questions. Do you set boundaries for your research? If yes, how? I presume this refers to how much time you allot for it. Um, and the second is, is your approach to interpretation of material affected by whether the subject of your biography is alive or not? Maybe Patrick could speak to that because he's had experience with subjects who are alive, which I have not. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think on the first question of setting boundaries, not really at the beginning, I definitely do think that there comes a, a time when you're researching anything, this is not particular to biography, uh, where you realize that you don't need to do any more. It's tempting to do more because it's always more fun to do the research than process the research. Um, but there definitely comes a point where you think, I, I, I'm just going to replicate if I go on doing more of this. Um, the dead alive thing I think was very difficult for me uh, and I uh, and I, I very much sort of took the lead from what Naipaul had said which is you know you are free to write the biography in full and that a life which or you know a life writing which attempts to limit the reality of what somebody did is not true life writing and this actually was something that he touched on in his in on his note in his Nobel uh, speech so in, in terms of whether he was dead or alive, when I was doing the writing, I just thought, imagine if somebody is reading this book in 30 years time, coming out of a different cultural setting to either me or V.S. Naipaul, how do they approach this subject? Uh, so that, that was how I, I dealt with it. But I'd say that in general, it's almost impossible to do that when you're writing about a living person. Um, you know, it's not impossible because I, I did it in this case, but it would be very, very difficult without a high level of cooperation from that person. I might just add on the question of limits that um, I think, I, I mean, I certainly agree with Patrick and, and my gauge for when I've hit the point that I need to stop is um, diminishing returns as Patrick implies that, you know, everything you find is sort of layering into something you already know. Um, but my great paranoia, which doubtless will be shared by some others in this group who have experience with historical research, is that something will come along that proves that everything I've thought is wrong. And I'm always worried about this, but there's no greater validation by contrast than the sense that something does come along because something always will come along, but that it fits with your interpretation. And typically, you know, when, when I've had the experience of sort of stopping because of diminishing returns, I have indeed found that whatever does pop up basically just confirms what I already thought. And that is, um, you know, maybe it's just a sign that I'm pigheaded and I've made up my mind and I can't change it at any point. But I think, I think more realistically, you do get to some stage where you, where you feel like, look, I mean, you know, I, I have an explanation that can make sense of whatever new evidence pops up, pops up. And, you know, I, I don't need to keep on just digging and digging and digging because I already have my point that I'm going to make. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Iftikhar Malik. Um, I'm summarizing uh, a little bit. Uh, he says, biography is a complex relationship with literature, uh, but an even more complicated interface with history. Uh, but we historians do value biographical works, though we have to be aware of reductionism of any type. Isn't it a challenge to create a balance while being reverent uh, to context and not just the person? I would interpret that question as falling into this perennial um, challenge, which is the representative versus the exceptional challenge. And this is something that comes up in the writing of history, independent of the writing of biography. And it is that when you write about history from the point of view of individuals, as we've already touched on a great deal in the last hour, you are achieving something quite um, compelling for the reader, namely putting history into a 
framework and a scale that is instantly accessible to the rest of us as fellow humans. Um, you do get, as Abhirajit said, that you were there quality. At the same time, it raises the question of who is the you? Um, and, um, and whenever we pick out any individual to write about from the past, we are, of course, um, relying on the set of contingent circumstances that allowed any records of that person's life to come to us. And we are also performing an act of selection that implies acts of exclusion by not writing about others. So I think that this is a general question that extends, as I say, across the writing of history through using individuals um, of any kind. And I could go on at length about that, but I think that's another, in a way, another uh, subject. Now, with biography, I mean, I, I think that some of the um, some of the skepticism that historians have shown toward biography over the last couple of generations is indeed a sort of pushing back against the hagiographic traditions of the of the 19th century and earlier. Um, and I think that the stance of scholarly biographers today toward their subjects tends, if anything, to be quite, um, how to put it, like, you know, self-consciously critical of the subjects, if anything. Um, you'll find plenty of books written about historic figures that are really quite openly critical about them and, and, and seek to, if anything, knock them off pedestals more often than not when written by scholars. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a challenge. I, you know, I have to say that I find it um, unfortunate that there's a often assumption, this comes actually to Aparajit's question about identifying with one subject, there's often an assumption that because you're writing about a certain figure, you, um, you admire that figure. And I don't think that's true at all, at least in the case of myself and probably Patrick and probably many other at least sort of scholarly and deep biographers is that if anything, we're drawn to figures who seem difficult to understand and a bit remote in certain ways and complicated and often self contradictory and that's precisely what makes them interesting subjects for study. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right that the, the contradictory elements of the person is often what draws you to them and makes them. Uh, potentially more interesting. I, but I, I think you do need to identify them to an extent in that what you're, you're, you're sort of trying to understand them and in a way make their case, even if you then subsequently undercut it by showing the actual impact on other people of what they did. So this is particularly true of, of V.S. Naipaul. But I do think that there's a need to reasonably and fairly represent why that person did a particular thing, why to them it seemed a reasonable course of action. So to that extent, I think you have to, you do have to inhabit the person. Um, and I remember feeling this with actually the very first book I did, the biography of Francis Young Husband, where you have to sort of try and think your way into the ideology of a, an army officer in 1880s, a British army officer in 1880s India, setting out on these various punitive expeditions. I think it's very important to try to think your way into why they thought it was a good course of action. In his case, it was partly because of the Christian evangelical upbringing that he would have had. But the same, I, I think, you know, has been true of Naipaul and of, and of Lessing. Um, and I think with Lessing, there are certainly, you know, particular personal decisions that she took in relation to other people and the kind of things that she were writing, which she was writing, which might appear inexplicable. Once you try to see it from her point of view, it makes sense. I don't think that necessarily means that at the end, when you've sort of completed that chapter, people are gonna like or admire that person, but at least you'll have some kind of understanding of them. Yes, um, I guess you have to be empathetic without sort of, yeah. um, without necessarily meaning that you endorse the person's uh, or actions or point of view. Um, of course, that also brings in to uh, focus the point that, um, you know, at the end of the day, the biographer is also an individual who has certain uh, opinions, certain worldviews. And uh, I suppose the challenge is how do you, uh, to what extent do you want to prevent that from sort of intruding into your assessment of the person? Um, it may be that your purpose is to evaluate that person from a particular point of view, 
so, so there are different ways. And, and of course, there's so many different types of biography. Um, and one of the questions that we just got relates to this. Um, and they say, you know, what do we do if you're writing a biography of a, a period when there's not much written record? How do you incorporate the subaltern voice? Um, how do you make sure that it's... Uh, and one can think of, you know, very interesting examples like uh, Nanjot Lahiri's um, book on Ashoka and, um, and of course several other, um, other books. I even think of Bill Bryson's very readable book on Shakespeare, um, where of course there's not much we know about Shakespeare, you know, people argue about who he was, but, but still there's so much uh, rich material to be, uh, to be accessed about the world in which he lived. Uh, so if, if both of you were to be writing, if either of you were to write a biography of someone from say 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, when you didn't have the kinds of variety of sources that you had for more recent times, how would you try to bring um, the, uh, you know, the experience of other people or other perspectives into it? This is a question from Lalit Narayan Singh. I mean, I think that there's a, an issue here, which we've of course touched on in all sorts of ways, but I'll but I'll name it a little differently, which is the question of kind of subjectivity. I mean, how far do you go inside somebody's head, and how far do you not? That is, um, you know, famously one of the things that novelists can do, quite aside from quote making things up unquote, is that they can really kind of get inside a person's head and chronicle their thoughts. And historians find it difficult to do that unless they have wonderful texts like the diaries of Doris Lessing or V.S. Naipaul to guide them, or Patricia Naipaul, as the case may be. Um, and so there's always a degree to which I think as a historian, as a biographer, we are kind of working from the outside in rather than the inside out. Um, depending on the nature of our sources. Now, I think that that is probably amplified for earlier periods when, among other things, the kind of confessional modes of, uh, of, of uh, autobiography were not, didn't take the same forms that we're familiar with um, today. And I think that therefore the idea that we can reconstruct the, the, the thoughts of a specific individual become a little bit more remote. But the idea that we can construct something about the life world or the uh, belief structure or something like that of an individual are, are by no means out of reach. And um, I would point to um, a, a, an article by uh, the historian Robin Fleming, who's based at Boston College, which appeared, I think, in the American Historical Review, maybe about 10 years ago or so which is about a, a biography of an unknown person from, I don't know, sort of medieval, early medieval England on the basis of the skeleton. And archeological evidence gives us lots of insight into you know, what kind of health people had and what kind of everyday uh, food they were eating and homes they were living in and kind of, you know, I mean, very subaltern, if you will, you know, very ordinary people that we can find out a great deal about on the basis of archaeological evidence. So that would be just one thing that I think we can actually turn to. And indeed, some of the most interesting and exciting history that's being written right now, I think, is being produced of periods that were previously sort of dismissed as, uh, well, prehistoric. I mean, we use the word historic to mean the era in which writing exists. But we can also look to evidence in the whole, you know, material culture and archaeological evidence to give us a great deal of insight into uh, the life worlds of people in the past. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with that. There are, there are very, very interesting things being done in history, which do feed into biography, where they're not group biographies in the conventional sense, where you, where, where you might say, you know, the group around Virginia Woolf or the group around James Joyce, but rather they're going back into historical records and they're saying we have quite detailed records on uh, 300 nuns over the course of 70 years in a, in a nunnery or monastery in southern France. And you can sort of have a, a kind of collective biography which has a lot of discovery out of it. Um, and I sometimes feel that with some of the uh, genetic discoveries that come from the come come from uh, you know bones and skeletons and for example getting into caves where people uh, 
20,000 years ago were doing these extraordinarily advanced uh, paintings of animals. I mean, all of these things do make you feel in a way that you are able to understand the lives of those, um, not quite those individuals, but those groups. So I think there are, there are lots of different routes, routes into it. Um, just one other, one other thing I was thinking as we were speaking is that often in biography, the crux of what makes a biography interesting is how far you're able to rediscover the formative periods of an individual's life. Um, in most cases, that is coming out of childhood circumstance, and you're then seeing what leads them to a certain uh, point. And I think if you're able to do that, that a whole lot becomes clear. Um, you know, quite often I find in a biography that the last half or the last third is less interesting. They've succeeded, they've done it. They're, they're replicating themselves either in their work or in, for example, the interviews they give. When people give multiple interviews, the later ones are always re repeats of the earlier ones, almost always, unless there's a very skilled interviewer. So it sort of becomes less interesting. There's something about that form formative period that, that generates the um, approach that they have. And I, I was actually thinking as Maya was speaking that it's interesting that you know, her, the way that she came to writing uh, her book on Conrad, Conrad, which I admire so much, was uh, as a historian coming out of being a trained historian and then moving into a sort of different approach to uh, history, whereas I was coming out of a, a first degree in English literature and then sort of diverting into history and diverting into um, biography. Um, you know, I also wonder, and again, this is sort of the, you know, playing the biographer that I think that, you know, Maya comes from a very distinguished academic family uh, and, you know, has a sort of academic approach from which she's branched out in this very creative way. Um, whereas in my case, you know, I went to university without my parents having been at university and it was a sort of new and strange world. And so I had a kind of different approach to how you deal with an academic subject. And you know, all these all these decades later, there's been this kind of convergence of intellectual interests. But it, to, to me, the sort of journey uh, is is intriguing that that we've had, which has been quite different, even though it sort of ended up in a a point of commonality. It's uh, interesting what you said about the last half being less interesting. Um, brings to mind something that Gopal Krishna Gokhale is supposed to have told uh, his associates when he was on his deathbed at the age of forty nine. He said, uh, don't worry, if I lived longer, I should only be repeating myself. Um, so uh, uh, I think we should uh, go to one last question, which is a student of ours, Manan, who would like to speak out his question. Could you be very brief, please, Manan? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, good evening. So this has been very insightful for me. And uh, I might be totally off track here, but then I've always assumed that uh, the authors that write biographies always connect to uh, the person that they are writing about on a personal level, right? So like um, how they've affected them personally. So I was just wondering if that was the case with you both. And I would like to know how, if it's not too much that I'm asking for. I mean, I think that this comes back a little bit to some of the things we were talking about, about, you know, your, how much, do you resemble Aparajit Aspas, right? How much do you resemble your subject? You have to share something with them. And, you know, I can definitely say that for me, you know, I didn't, um, people always wanna know, did you like your subject? Do you like this person? Would you want to sit down with them and have dinner with them and so on? And I, I don't, I didn't think in those terms when I was writing about Conrad. I, I thought this is an interesting person and I would like to figure out what's going on with this person. And I would above all like to figure out what's going on with the, um, the, the universe that he both lived in and reflected in his fiction. But I never developed a sense of um, kind of kinship or anything like that. You know, I, I in fact, I don't, it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, there were there were things that he said, and I would come across these little flashes, and I'd think I can sort of hear this person, I can sort of get a sense of it. And there were things that he experienced that I felt that I could, you know, to use the phrase of the moment, relate to. Um, 
but every time I thought that I also second guessed myself because I was worried that, you know, we always do this, you know, we're trying to kind of see ourselves in things and how much is that itself a kind of made up, um, made up posture. So I, I, I didn't, I mean, I felt wary about the whole thing. And I felt in the end that in a sense, a sort of healthy distance and an examination of this figure as a person who was interesting, but not necessarily, um, you know, if they were like me, it would be less interesting to me in a sense, you know, it was those differences that I continually found animating. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel pretty much the, the same way on this. It, 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 you don't, it's not so much that you have to have the sort of personal connection or liking it, it, of them. It's more, more that you have to find them interesting. You have to find them interesting. If you don't, then why would you want to write a whole biography on that individual? Um, you know, and in the case of the Doris Lessing biography, when the uh, executors uh, of her estate came to me and said, would you like to be considered uh, to write it? Um, I mean, I, I, I'd read a certain amount of her work. I knew her life story vaguely. Um, I'd met her very briefly in the late 1990s. So I had a sort of physical impression of her on, a, on the basis of a five minute conversation. But suddenly when I began to investigate the story, I thought, you know, this is the story of World War I and the globalization of war because of what it did to her parents, how it led to the dispersal of her family to uh, Persia or Iran where she was born. So therefore it's also the story of uh, late colonialism. Uh, it was telling that story. Uh, her parents then go to the, the Great Exhibition in London in, I think, 1924, correct me if I'm wrong, any historians, um, and they see posters of people growing wheat in Rhodesia, and they think, this looks like a great life, let's, let's go there. So you then get the, the, the sort of movement of the family into this white settler community uh, in southern Rhodesia, for which they're totally ill-equipped. They don't have the knowledge, the training, the money, the experience and then they have this very difficult life you know out of that comes her personal drive or lure towards communism as a somebody in her sort of late teens early 20s so you're getting again you're getting the global story of the 20th century through the the attraction to communism that people uh felt when they were in very unjust societies and she was very clear from her teens that this was a completely unjust hierarchy. It was a sort of extreme colonial structure. Um, you know, and then she, the, there are various things that follow from that. She ends up in the 1950s going to the UK. She's at the forefront of feminism. She's also at the forefront of certain mystical movements, which were very popular in the 1960s, 1970s, sort of where mysticism met uh, hippie culture, met uh, sexual liberation, men, met um, sort of social revolution, communal living. Um, you know, a lot. Of, she she knew people like Lang, who uh, redefined the idea of what madness was, and whether it was the individual who was had mental illness, or whether it was the society that was making them that way. Which again linked into sort of arguments of the people like Foucault were make, making. And I suddenly saw that you could actually tell a sort of story of the entire twentieth century through what had happened in this one life. Um, how did I get to this point? Um, so, I, so, so I think, you know, that was not a case of me thinking, oh, I really like the person. I, oh, I really like Doris Lessig. I mean, I liked her, her spirit. I liked her chutzpah, which you can see if you, you know, if you look on YouTube, you can see the video of her being told by reporters that she's won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And um, she responds with something like, oh, I've already won every damn prize. And, you know, this is just another one. And she's very sort of dismissive and very engaging. So there, there is something sort of likable uh, about her. But I think that, you know, the reason that I wanted to do the biography was because the life story is interesting and because of the way that it connects to history. Thank you very much. Um, the birds outside are roosting. I can't mute them but it's probably an indication that we are approaching the end of our time. Thank you very much to everyone who's attended and for your wonderful questions. There are some more fascinating questions. I wish we had time to take them, uh, but please feel free to write to any of the speakers or to me. Sorry, I said that on your behalf. <laughs>
uh, but certainly please feel free to like me uh, if I can help in any way. Uh, I'd like to turn, turn it over to uh, my colleagues, Shita and uh, Sartre, um, if you'd like to say a few words before we finish. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aprajit, uh, for moderating this. And thank you so much, Patrick and Maya, for this wonderfully and very engaging session. And it really, I mean, uh, uh, opened up a lot of uh, ideas and you know aspects of uh, reading also biographies. I've been reading a lot of political biographies myself, and I've been dabbling with certain questions of you know uh, which were discussed here. So it was really a very uh, very interesting session. Thank you so much for this, and to all the participants, we thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you in uh, the. Uh, forthcoming events of the seminar and lecture series uh, in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you.